Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, accepting our invitation to be here tonight for this great lecture. Uh, it must have been a difficult decision to make because, of course, the weather is not great. Uh, but uh, the topic tonight has to do with chaotic world, so why not uh, turbulent uh, weather? So you have to make difficult choice whether am I going, am I not going? I think you made the right decision. It's going to be very interesting. Um, my name is Yvon Grenier. I teach here in the Department of Political Science at ZFX, and I have the great pleasure of being the MC tonight, uh, Master of Ceremonies. I prefer to say MC. Um, so as much as uh, there's a lot of chaos in the weather and in politics, but there will be no chaos in the way this event will be organized, okay? Because I'm here to make sure this is going to be the rule. Um, so we have a number of speaker le speakers leading to the main speaker tonight. Uh, the first one is Dr. Kevin Wamsley, who is president of uh, St. Francis uh, Xavier University, and he's going to present some welcoming remarks. So, Kevin. Thank you very much, Dr. Grenier. As you can see, with the living room is set up, we're going to have a wonderful evening here tonight. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the uh, Alan J. McKechn Lectures Committee. Um, some of you who don't know Alan J., it's a good story. He was born in Inverness, Nova Scotia, the same year as my father in 1921. Always a supporter and champion of uh, the Gaelic and Celtic heritage of Cape Breton and uh, every, everywhere else in North America. Alan Jay graduated from St. Francis Xavier University in 1944 with a BA. Uh, went on to, to do an MA at the University of Toronto and then on to MIT. Uh, McKechn was a professor of economics and uh, head of the Department of Economics and Social Sciences here at St. FX and also uh, worked on behalf of the Faculty of Extension. He was a great advocate for working class families and he, he joined uh, the House of Commons uh, in 1953 and he was re-elected eight times. He served as MP for Inverness Richmond and then for Cape Breton Highlands Canso. He was sworn into the Queen's Privy Council in 1963 and Alan Jay served as a Minister of the Crown in the cabinets of Lester Pearson, Pierre Trudeau and John Turner, holding some of the most senior portfolios of economic, social and foreign policy. What a career that he had. He ran for the leadership of the Liberal Party of Canada in 1968 and served as interim party leader in 1979, prior to Pierre Elliott Trudeau's return to politics. He considered his uh, proudest achievements as the Medical Care Act in 1966 and the Guaranteed Income Supplement for Seniors and the Canada Labour Code, all brought from concept to reality through a very skilled and patient leadership. And he joined the Senate from 1984 until 1996 and uh, was, as you can imagine, the recipient of a, a number of honorary degrees. Alan Jay uh, received the uh, appointed as an officer of the Order of Canada in 2008 and passed away in 2017 at the age of 96. We're very proud to have that service uh, in Andy Ganesh, of course. And we'll remember him as one of Canada's most respected politicians and statesmen, and uh, we'll remember him as one of ours. I just want to take a minute uh, to let you know who was given this esteemed address over the years. And it's really important to remember this list because I don't think any other universities could boast of this particular speaker's list. And of course, we have a, an honored guest here this evening. Um, the lecture series was established in 1996, and the first speaker who uh, gave the address in 1997 was the Honorable Bob Ray, followed by the Honorable Frank McKenna, Mr. Dalton Camp, Senator J.S. Grafstein, the, Honor the Right Honorable John Turner, the Honorable Roy, Roy Romano, Mr. Preston Manning, Dr. Margaret McMillan, Dr. Jennifer Welsh, the Right Honorable Jean Chrétien, the Honorable Flora MacDonald, the Right Honorable Joe Clark, the Honorable Lowell Murray, who was here with us this evening, the Honorable Dr. Donald J. Johnson, Mr. Alan R. Gregg, the Right Honorable Paul Martin, the Right Honorable Beverly McLaughlin, and last year, Lyndon McIntyre. And that is quite a cast, I must say, since 1997. So we're very proud to have one of the most prestigious lectures in the country 
and I'm very excited to welcome you here to tonight's talk. Thank you very much. And now talking about uh, Honorable Laurel Murray, who is, of course, uh, a member of that committee and has been a member of that family of the Alan J. McEachern Lecture Series for a while. He did a wonderful lecture uh, here a few years ago, and I'd like to ask him now to come and to uh, introduce the speaker today. Mr. President, Friends, ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, in thinking about my role in tonight's event, I uh, recalled that the eponymous hero of this lecture series, the Honorable Alan J. McKechn, while he had a well-deserved reputation as a powerful public speaker, was also a great listener. This is what made him such a formidable debater. And God knows I have reason to recall that, having sat across the aisle from him when he was opposition leader in the Senate and I was government leader there. Uh, he debated very vigorously, asked questions very, very pointedly. I recall one occasion in which um, he was making a speech and I, rather incautiously, was commenting on the speech from my seat as he went along. I was offering comments and he uh, found this a bit tiresome and turned on me and made some statement to indicate his displeasure. I said, I was just trying to be helpful. <laughs> to which he said, I don't need any help and if I did, I wouldn't ask for it from my honorable friend. <laughs> with Alan Jay, as with other great parliamentarians, the so-called debates of recent times, in which members exchange canned speeches, talking past each other, were an abomination. Alan Jay and most of his prominent contemporaries took notes, rose, addressed themselves to important points made by previous speakers in the debate, and raised other arguments that they considered needed, that they needed to be considered. All this is by way of saying that Alan Jay would have greatly approved of the lecture committee's choice of David McNaughton as this year's speaker. The title of David's speech, Difficult Choices for Canada in a Chaotic World, would have been irresistible, obviously because of the salience of the subject especially for the Canadian internationalist that Alan Jay was, but equally because of the authority and experience that David brings to it. His most recent, and some would say his most successful public service was as Canadian ambassador to the United States, obviously and by far our most important foreign posting. There he played a critical role in the achievement of the new, some would say improved, Canada-US-Mexico Free Trade Agreement, the new NAFTA, although in Trump's Washington, you're not allowed to call it that. Our ambassador to Washington must have the full confidence of our government, and in particular of the prime minister. Back in the day, R.B. Bennett appointed his brother-in-law, Mackenzie King appointed Vincent Massey, Brian Mulroney appointed Derek Burney, Jean Chrétien appointed his diplomat nephew, Raymond Chrétien. Justin Trudeau appointed his much admired, experienced, and respected friend, David McNaughton. David McNaughton had been a presence, always politically, if not physically, in what I can describe with historical accuracy, if a bit ruefully, as liberal Ottawa as it was then and is now. How long, oh Lord, how long? <laughs> he was for six years senior advisor to the Honorable Don Jameson of Newfoundland, Alan Jay's great friend, cabinet colleague, and Atlantic regional ally. He took up his duties as ambassador to Washington, already well known and well regarded 
in the business community, notably at the most senior levels of Canadian and North American communications firms. He'd been Canadian and North American president of Hill and & Knowlton and president of Public Affairs International, which purchased Decima Research to create the Public Affairs Resource Group. Alan J. McKechn was an internationalist long before he went to Ottawa. He became an ardent internationalist here at St. Effex as a student, later as a professor, and an activist in our extension department. Internationalism is in the St. Effex DNA. One of the reasons we are happy to welcome a man who has done Canada proud in one of the most challenging of our foreign assignments. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David McNaughton. Thanks very much, uh, Lowell. And uh, I, um, I thought that I might start off uh, before I get into the, the substance of the, uh, my address to talk a little bit about my uh, relationship to uh, this part of the country. Um, I grew up in Ontario uh, in a small little village just outside of Hamilton. Um, and uh, I had decided that after I graduated from high school in, uh, in Ontario that I would either go to university in the United States or I would go to the University of Western Ontario. But uh, I took a year off and I went and I, I, I taught in a small uh, seminary in, in France. The name of the seminary was uh, Collège Saint Francis Xavier, as a matter of fact. Um, and when I returned back home after the year in France, I decided I didn't want to go to Western and be a frosh when all my buddies were in second year. And so I'd think about doing something else and going somewhere else. And I uh, had a friend who knew the football coach at the University of New Brunswick, and they recruited me to come down and play football. And so the last time I was here at St. of X, um, I played for the University of New Brunswick Red Bombers against uh, St. of X. I won't tell you what the outcome was because <laughs> it didn't work out all that well for us. But um, the other thing is you might wonder, well, how did I end up ever working for the cabinet minister from Newfoundland? And, and what happened was that in my political science class uh, on a Friday morning, I was sitting beside this young woman who I found quite attractive, and I asked her what she was doing for the weekend. And she said she was going to a student liberal convention in Halifax. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, funny, I'm, I'm going to the same convention. <laughs> so uh, I ended up in Halifax, and we arrived uh, late in the day, and there were they were having the elections for to become president of the Atlantic Province's student liberals. And neither one of the candidates seemed to have any support. Um, so I ran, and I won. <laughs> um, and uh, as a result of that, the next summer, they brought all of the uh, regional presidents of the student liberals to Ottawa, and because, of course, I was the Atlantic Province's student liberal president, I got to work for Don Jameson. And at the end of the summer, he said, when you graduate, please come back and work for me full time. And I did um, for, as Lowell said, for six and a half years. Um, had the experience at the age of about 25 years old of having uh, because he ended up in industry, trade, and commerce, and, and foreign affairs, uh, visiting something like 50 countries before I was 25 years old, um, and got to know Alan McCacken extremely well, because the two of them were thick as thieves. So um, it was a wonderful experience. I thoroughly enjoyed my time uh, in, in the Maritimes uh, at UNB, and uh, visited virtually every outport in Newfoundland, and, uh, and also had a wonderful experience around the world. But one of the things when we talk about Canada, the difficult decisions that we have to make in a chaotic world, I remember Don Jameson used to quote all the time a, uh, a historian who was from the 19th century named Jacob 
Burkhart, whose, uh, whose line that uh, Jameson used to use all the time uh, was the essence of tyranny is the denial of complexity. And it strikes me today that uh, as we have some of these extraordinarily complicated issues that we are trying to deal with, that these words are, have never been more true, that people seem to think that everything is uh, capable of being reduced to slogans, uh, that people spend too much time uh, talking at each other uh, rather than trying to find common ground. And when, um, when I was appointed ambassador, uh, I was presented my credentials to President Obama uh, in March of 2016. Um, and while uh, the initial um, reports out of the relationship between the Prime Minister and the President were that it was some kind of a bromance, the reality is that Obama was on the tail end of his administration and the Prime Minister was at the beginning of his. And we had a couple of tough trade issues to deal with, one of them being softwood lumber. Um, and the President and his uh, US trade representative did not want to make any deals with us that might impact on the approval of the TPP and Congress. And so while the uh, relationship was was warm and uh, uh, you know we got along extremely well with them we weren't able to accomplish very much because of the mismatch of uh, our objectives so then of course um, things happened in the fall of uh, 2016 and we ended up with a president of the United States who was uh, quite different than every other president that had been elected post Second World War and he was different in the sense that um, since the Second World War, every US president, every administration, every Congress had really adopted the approach that, particularly on trade, uh, that a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, after the Second World War, when uh, Europe was decimated, the Marshall Plan was put into effect, uh, the United Nations was formed the uh, uh, general agreement on tariffs and trades was begun. And all of that kind of philosophy of multilateralism, of working together to build the economies of the Western world in particular, um, was, was the approach that everyone adopted. Donald Trump uh, not only spoke out against NAFTA during the election, um, but he really took the approach that America had been ripped off uh, by every trade deal, by every country that it was trading with, and that his approach to negotiations was there are going to be winners and losers, and we're going to win, and we're going to make sure you lose. Um, and it was pretty blunt and pretty open. And one of the reasons that he got elected uh, was because there were significant parts of the United States of America that felt left out of the prosperity that had been generated generally. You had vast swaths of uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, West Virginia, whether you be in the coal business or whether you be in the auto business, where um, people that had been making a good living um, ended up unemployed and very resentful. And it was a lot easier to blame somebody else than to uh, take responsibility themselves, either individually, for, collectively, or as the, the United States of America. Um, as someone who grew up in and around uh, Hamilton, Ontario, when I was going to high school, um, most of the people, most of my classmates had no aspiration to go on to university. They were gonna go work in a steel mill. They were gonna, they were gonna do well. Uh, they could not only afford a home and a car, but probably, you know, a, a summer cottage. Um, and there were 17,000 people working in the steel industry in Hamilton at that time. And I think today there's something like a thousand. And this was something that had been replicated in Youngstown, Ohio, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and elsewhere. So, so Donald Trump tapped into something that was um, was was there, which existed. I remember in the fall 
of 2016 in September having a group of labor leaders uh, to the embassy for dinner and all of them, all of the leadership of all of the labor unions uh, said that they were supporting Hillary Clinton and all of them admitted to me that more than 50% of their members were gonna vote for Donald Trump. So we ended up with a, with a difficult situation where we had an existential threat to Canada's economy um, and uh, a president who uh, did not believe in a win-win or win-win-win, including Mexico. And we also had a situation where we had an asymmetrical relationship from an economic point of view with the United States in the sense that, you know, 70, 73% of our trade went to the United States, a much, much higher percentage of our GDP depended on foreign trade their market, they have 350 people in their market. Yes, Canada was the largest trading partner of 35 states, but the reality is, is that um, their, their dependence on foreign trade is much less than ours. So face that, facing that, we, we had um, a bit of a challenge, to put it mildly. And I think what happened, uh, uh, you know, at the beginning was we came to the conclusion that there was only one way that we could win, that we could hold our own at least, and if not, do better than the existing agreement. And that was, frankly, to work harder, uh, to be smarter, to work together, federally, provincially, across the aisle, with the private sector, with labor, um, and and also, um, what I discovered fairly early on is that we actually did have some strengths that I hadn't really fully appreciated. One of them was we have a remarkably talented uh, group of public servants um, who understand trade, who've been through the wars of uh, many, many trade negotiations, and who really understood all of the nuances that you had to have when you were gonna have a negotiation as complex as ours was, it was uh, we have a $600 billion trading relationship with the United States, and there are all sorts of, of the little things that go on in the, in the auto industry, like the rules of origin that I had no clue about. But we actually had people within uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs who actually understood all of the substance of those and were able to guide us. Um, we also found out, and, and this is where you know, we, we used it to our advantage, that while in total the United States did not have as big a, or Canada was not as important to the U.S. as the U.S. was to us, that there were pockets where um, we were extraordinarily important. And they weren't just border states. There were states like Florida and Arizona and a whole series of others where you know, Canada's trade with Canada, investment with Canada was really important where there were really important senators or members of Congress or governors. And so we determined that what we were gonna do is to work those relationships to the maximum, to try to get those people on as allies because I thought a bit naively that, you know, we're nice people, we're good friends with the Americans, you know, we're allies in NATO and NORAD, and if we just go, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a friendly person, if I just go and say, why don't you be nice to us, that they'd be nice to us. Well, not a chance. Uh, not a chance before Donald Trump, and certainly not a chance after that. So we had to actually rely on Americans to do a lot of the lobbying for us, whether it be in terms of the specifics or in terms of the general, um, you know, getting the agreement through, making sure that we could get some of the things that we wanted out of it. And as it turned out, um, I am extraordinarily proud of the agreement that we ended up with. Uh, as I say, it was a, it was a product of an exceptionally talented public service and something that I had never seen in all of my years in being involved in uh, government and in politics was a remarkable degree of cooperation uh, between federal and provincial governments, uh, between the, or with members of parliament of all stripes, 
uh, and of the business community and labor and indigenous people. And I can tell you without a doubt that had we not had that kind of level of cooperation, that kind of Team Canada approach to things, I do not believe that we would ever have ended up where we did. And, and I mention that and I go into that in some detail because I think it's instructive and important for us to understand as we face some of the other challenges around the world that, you know, we're 37 million people uh, in a huge global economy where many of the um, many of the institutions that have supported the liberal democracies, the international order that we have come to rely on are either broken or dysfunctional. And while we might want to think that somehow or other we're going to get that back, the WTO, to where it should be, and somehow or other the UN is going to become more relevant, I'm skeptical. Um, I think that the, regardless of whether it is Donald Trump who wins the second term or whether it is someone else who wins, um, that we are, that the status quo in terms of international institutions uh, will never go back to what they were. And therefore, we can um, get together as a country. It doesn't mean we have to agree on everything, but building a consensus and working together to develop a Canadian position and then finding allies with whom we can work to achieve the goals that we have as Canadians to establish not just um, the kind of things that say we're out there articulating our values, but where we're actually going to do something that makes a difference in international affairs, uh, I think that we are going to have to make sure that we don't retreat into our corners, say, oh, well, at least we got that NAFTA thing done, now we can go back uh, to fighting amongst each other and criticizing each other. And, and in that regard, you know, we face a rather uh, challenging situation right now, which is the deterioration in the relationship between the United States and China. Uh, and I don't believe that this is going to uh, come to any end uh, anytime soon. I think we are into a struggle which will last for many years, if not decades. Um, and I think that what is happening more and more at the present moment uh, is the United States is going to be leaning on us and saying, you're either with us or you're against us. And if, in fact, not just with China, but with other countries, we, need, we want to have sovereignty. We want to have an independent foreign policy. It doesn't mean that we are going to poke the Americans in the eye or stop being their best friends or closest allies. But there will be times, as there have been in the past, where we want to take an independent position. We want to take a position that's different from the Americans. And the question really becomes, in this environment, which is, you're either with me or against me, how do we do that? And I think that um, the answer to that is not easy. We have benefited substantially over the last 75 years from the institutions that were set up after the Second World War and the protective umbrella of uh, United States defense and security. And I don't think we've pulled our weight recently as much as we should. And so if, in my view, we are going to be able to have an independent foreign policy and take the stances we want to when we want to, uh, we're actually going to have to step up from a defense and security point of view in a way which we have not done for some decades under, under liberal and conservative governments. We uh, are going to have to do something about asserting our sovereignty in the Arctic. We're going to have to take a larger role in cybersecurity in terms of defense of the, and support uh, in uh, this hemisphere, whether that be, as I say, in cybersecurity, whether that be in uh, opioids, whether that be in dealing with 
Latin America in terms of the situation in Venezuela and uh, in Central America. And I don't think that that kind of conversation has taken place enough in this country about what that means, what it is that our role is going to be. Because if we, we cannot exercise soft power, in my view, unless we demonstrate that we are prepared to step up uh, from a defense point of view. And that doesn't mean that I believe that we've got to get to 2%, like Donald Trump says. I mean, what we have to do is to have a discussion in this country about what does it mean, what do we want to do to assert our independence, and where do we want to do it. Um, and uh, unless and until we're actually prepared to get together as a country and, and have that kind of discussion, chart a course and move ahead on it, um, I think we're going to be invariably in a situation where the Americans are going to dictate what it is their international position is going to be. And I remember, you know, it struck me first when we were negotiating the NAFTA agreement and one of the first things that they put on the table was this clause that said, um, in the event that any of the parties end up negotiating a free trade agreement with a non-market economy, uh, we have the right to essentially kick them out. The only thing they didn't say was a non-market economy where the first uh, initial is C and the, one is, the last one is A, right? And um, we ended up, you know, substantially watering down that clause, but they were essentially saying, you deal with the Chinese, you get a deal with the Chinese, and we're going to boot you out of NAFTA. Now, when I was in Washington uh, two weeks ago for the signing of the uh, USMCA, I ran into the US Trade Representative, and I said that uh, I see that you guys have done a deal with China, and uh, the Mexicans, uh, we are talking about maybe kicking you out of the NAFTA agreement. He, uh, he didn't take it too well, but in any case, um, again, I think, you know, when we saw during the last election campaign that uh, these kinds of issues, this kind of serious uh, discussion and debate uh, did not take place. I don't know whether uh, this was um, fulfilling, uh, you know, Kim Campbell's line about uh, elections are not a time to have serious discussions, um, but the last, the debate during the last election campaign was um, not just weak, I found it quite appalling, uh, and I hope that we find a way, at least uh, in, in between elections, to begin to have those kinds of conversations, and they can't just be in Ottawa in the House of Commons or in the Senate, they have to be something which we engage all Canadians in uh, if we're going to be able to um, to chart an independent course, and as I say, um, the essence of tyranny is the denial of complexity, and these things are extraordinarily complex. And I want to deal with one other issue, which is equally complex and equally challenging, and again, one where I think we need to learn from the U.S.-Canada trade experience and that is the whole issue of climate change and resource development. And I think what's happening right now is that you have more than two sides, but certainly on the one hand you have the leave it in the ground people, and then on the other side you have the climate deniers who basically uh, seem to think that uh, we can continue along the path that we have without taking seriously uh, a plan for carbon reduction. And my own view is both of them are extraordinarily uh, wrong and destructive in terms of not just achieving any kind of uh, real carbon reduction in the country, but also are very much a threat uh, to our economy and to our national unity. And when I say this, I mean that, and I've had this conversation with the Premier of Alberta, which is, um, if it appears 
uh, that we have abandoned any effort to put a cap on oil sands carbon emissions or that we are uh, looking as if we're backing off of our commitment uh, to do something about our carbon footprint as a country, it will be extremely difficult for us to sell our oil and gas, particularly in the United States. Um, the reality is whether, it, whether Donald Trump is president or not, uh, a lot of the efforts to block um, pipelines and the export of our natural resources in the United States has come from the state level. The problem with Line 5 going along the bottom of Lake Michigan isn't in Washington, it's in Lansing, Michigan with the Attorney General. The challenges to uh, Keystone XL have come from Montana and from Nebraska and from uh, environmental groups who are using legal means uh, to block the export uh, of our oil and gas. So we have a situation at the present moment where we need to demonstrate not just to the United States, but to investors who are beginning uh, to uh, be challenged in terms of whether they're gonna put their money into projects that are seen not to be clean. Um, but the answer to that is not to simply say, well, we're gonna forget about oil and gas in this country. I don't know how long we're gonna to continue to consume fossil fuels, whether it's 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 75 years, whatever it is. The fact of the matter is, is that when the last barrel of oil is consumed on this planet, I'd rather it come from Canada than somewhere else. And so, but that's only gonna happen if we build a consensus in this country, east and west, conservative, liberal, NDP, and involving indigenous people uh, in terms of making sure that not only uh, are they involved in the decision making, but they are benef beneficiaries of it. And some people say to me that this is really um, crazy, that this is never gonna happen, that the two sides are too far apart and that there isn't, it's impossible to build a consensus. And I frankly don't believe that. I think that we are in a situation where we have an opportunity in this country um, that we've shown before where we have, as a country, found ways to meet the challenges, whether they be transportation challenges, whether they be the cold, whether they be communications. And when we when we've found a way to deal with the challenges we face here at home, we've been able to also build strong companies that have then exported that knowledge and that expertise abroad. And the climate change, uh, I think, isn't a matter of difficult choices. It is a matter of huge opportunity. We have to find a way to reduce our carbon emissions. And in doing so, I believe that we can create huge economic opportunities in terms of the technology that will make the world, enable the world to reduce its carbon footprint um, substantially. But that will only happen if we can develop a consensus. And again, it has to be a federal provincial consensus. It has to involve the private sector. And it has to be where some of the politicians are gonna turn down the rhetoric and um, and work for the entire country. Um, I, I know that when uh, there are times, uh, there were times when I was in Washington when I used to get up in the morning and I'd think, um, this is really hard and it's getting worse. And sometimes I would get quite discouraged, uh, particularly after either um, reading the tweets or watching television. Um, <laughs> and then, um, you know, we would actually get to the point where uh, we started talking about um, problems as being opportunities. And, and 
Gerald Butts uh, and I worked together in uh, the Ontario government for a brief period of time. And uh, I know that when we, when I went into the Premier's office in Ontario, um, we inherited a fairly substantial deficit and we'd as usual made all sorts of promises during the election campaign that were gonna be really hard to, uh, to keep. And the bureaucrats kept coming in and, and every day they'd come in and they'd say, you know, here's the situation. And we'd say, oh my God, not another problem. Um, and finally, and we were getting depressed and discouraged and everything else. And then finally I said, look, every time somebody comes in and says, here's a problem, what we got to do is say, oh great, another opportunity. <laughs> and, and it actually turned our psychology around, turned our mood around and helped us work through some very difficult problems. And I think, you know, when you, when you look out at the world today and you see the chaos that exists, uh, when you see the challenges and you can't say that these are simple solutions and that there are, you can't deny the complexity, but at any time when there are problems, when there are challenges, there are also opportunities. And I think what we showed um, in the two, three and a half years that I was in Washington is that up against what some people thought were insurmountable odds that we could actually achieve success, but we could only do that together as Canadians, working hard, doing our homework, not yelling at each other, but figuring out how we could get practical solutions to complex problems. And I really do think that that is possible in this country today. And I think it's also important because I think Canada can show we have had we have made a difference. We have within this country a diversity in our population that is accepted and embraced and valued like very few other countries in the world. And I said to some of my friends in Ottawa a while ago, I said, you know, um, we all talk about how we respect and embrace diversity, and we do. The only thing we should start embracing is the diversity of opinions too. And that those who share have a different opinion than we have, we should try to find common ground uh, rather than getting into our, our corners and um, yelling at each other and using, using social media to tear down the other person's arguments as opposed to try to find the common ground, which I think will benefit us all. So. Thank you very much. It is a delight to be back here in the Maritimes. Um, and uh, I, I can tell you that as a, I, I say to the uh, student, we, we used to have interns come through the embassy every uh, semester. And at the end of the, their time, I used to sit down with them and I'd say, and they'd ask me, you know, have you got any advice for us? And I used to always say, don't try to plan out your life uh, step by step. Don't think about blocking off any other, any alternatives because every time I have tried to figure out what I'm gonna do next and had not a clue, something has come along that has been a wonderful experience. And it was a wonderful experience to go to school here uh, in the Maritimes. It was um, a unique experience to end up being president of the Atlantic Provinces Student Liberals um, <laughs> and to work uh, in Ottawa. And, and, uh, and, and what happened in terms of becoming ambassador was Katie and Jerry and I were planning the election campaign in 2015 in the spring of uh, 2015 and we went out for a drink after and, and uh, Katie said to me, what, if we win, what do you want? And I said, I, I don't want anything. I love, love what I'm doing. I'm happy. Life's good. She said, no, I, anything. And I said, no, I don't, I don't have anything. Ah, well, of course, I'd love to be Canada's ambassador to the United States, but we know that's not going to happen. <laughs> and uh, the night that the prime, or the day the prime minister was sworn in, I was there with my youngest daughter at the after party and he came over and said, 
pack your bags, you're going to Washington. Uh, and then in November of 2016, I thought, be careful of what you ask for. <laughs> but it was uh, an extraordinary privilege and an honor to represent uh, our country in a, in a really challenging time. And I came away with a greater respect for uh, the strength of our nation, uh, the dedication of public servants and others who worked with me. And uh, I will never forget uh, the experience that I had and for, will always be thankful for it. And so thank you all very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'd like to know what's on your mind. Rather than just